Hi everyone, welcome back for Music Notes tonight. We're gonna listen to a song that I know you all enjoy singing at the end of a church service. Let's take a listen. Sent Forth by God's Blessings. So our song today is written, it was written in 1964. So actually, it's pretty new, the words are anyway, that we sing. And it was written by Omer Westendorf. Now he lived from 1916 to 1997. So he published this hymn under a pseudonym, and he had a few, but when he first published Sent Forth by God's Blessings, he published that under the name of J. Clifford Evans, and that was published in the People's Mass Book, and I said 1964. So he was Catholic, and it was the first vernacular hymn book to implement the changes of the Roman Catholic liturgy that was ordered by the uh, Second Vatican Council. So very interesting, at that time in the 1960s, some changes were taking place in the Catholic Church. And the words and how this came to be is sort of a result of some of those changes. So a little bit about our writer for the text today, Omer. He was born on February 24th, 1916 in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he goes on to become a church organist for over 40 years, and he started when he was just 20 years old, and he served at St. Bonaventure Church there in Cincinnati. Now, he was one of the earliest lyricists for Roman Catholic liturgy music in English. Originally, we've got um, Latin going on. Now, he died, I mentioned, in 1997 at the age of 81. Now, sent forth by God's blessing, it's a Catholic hymn. And it's a song about transitions, literally transitioning from being in a worship service and then going out into the world, which is why it's traditionally sung at the end of the service. But... It's also a song of transition itself within the Catholic Church. So on December 4th, 1963, less than a year earlier, the Second Vatican Council released a document called the Sacrosanctum Concilium. And it was best known for allowing the use of vernacular language in mass. And it also encouraged the use of congregational music. So psalms, responses, and even hymns. And they did this in an effort to increase the participation within the church body and also to create a sense of unity among all of the parishioners uh, within the church, the whole church. So at this time, the Catholic Church was sensing a need to open its doors to worship and practice and elevate the blessings to, um, to expand the local expressions of tradition and to encourage involvement of all believers. Um, and they were focusing that involvement in inside the church and also outside the church walls. So they're looking for a way to become more inclusive. And they figured 
um, just that change of the vernacular to become more modern um, would help be more relatable. And so obviously no single event um, happened to make this transition one as large as this take place. It wasn't a result of a single movement. Uh, even before the council convened, ideas about different ways to live their faith and traditions were welling up uh, within the Catholic laity and clergy. So a lot of discussion was going on. Now it was Omer, our lyricist today, um, who was the organist and choir master at St. Bonaventure Catholic Church uh, in Cincinnati that authored this hymn. And he also authored some hymns that we know and sing. So, sent forth by God's blessings can be found in our hymnal on page 643. And then if you just flip backwards one page to 641, you will find you satisfy the hungry heart. So you'll recognize this. You satisfy the hungry heart with gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to eat. So we sing that for communion. We also sing sent forth by God's blessings at communion. Uh, and then Omer Weston, West, Westendorf uh, also wrote, let's see, we're not as familiar with this one, but it's probably, you'll recognize it. It's When Charity and Love Prevail. When Charity and Love Prevail, So those are just a couple of the songs that he wrote in our hymnal in addition to sent forth by God's blessings. He was just one such lay uh, Catholic who was hard at work creating and spreading new music after this concilium took place that kind of released the floodgates for some change within the music community in the Catholic Church. And Omer got his start in publishing music after World War II. He um, brought home music for his parish choir in Cincinnati. He brought some mass settings that he had discovered when he was in Europe, in Holland. And he brought them home to his home church. And then interest in this new music being published in Europe led to his creation of the World Library of Sacred Music, which was initially a music importing firm that brought a lot of the music from Europe into the U.S. parishes, a new repertoire. And then Omer, operating out of his garage for the first few years of getting this together, um, Omer often joked that he was surprised by the expression of visitors who stopped by and found a wide range of sheet music in various stages of storage. Uh, I guess his garage where he housed all of this music was pretty much in disarray all the time. But I don't know, if he's like me, my desk may look like a mess, but I know exactly where everything is. So for me, it's all organized for an inside my head, maybe not to an onlooker, but I'm sure that's how he was. He knew where everything was. And then later that would become the World Library Publications. The company began publishing some of its own music and Omer's music. And as I mentioned, Omer had several pin names and he composed numerous compositions for liturgical use and a couple of these we just mentioned. Now, when this kind of trickle began where Catholic authors were writing music in their vernacular language for their local situations, uh, a massive flood of new hymns and liturgies um, started being written after that release of the 
sacrosanctum concilium. And so there were three or four main goals of this sacred council. They, the goals were number one, they desired to impart an ever increasing vigor to Christian life of the faithful. Number two, they wanted to adapt more suitably to the needs of current times and um, the institutions that were subject to change. And the fourth goal was to strengthen whatever could help to call the whole of mankind into the household of the church. So those four main goals. So sent forth by God's blessings is in many ways a direct response to that change within the Catholic Church, that sacrosanctum concilium. And not only by its existence, but in its contents and its usage. And that was a bit clearer in its original text, and it has been adapted um, over the years for, so as I mentioned, this is a Catholic hymn, and the Lutherans, ours is a little bit changed, and if we were to open up a Methodist hymnal, they have a little different arrangement of it too, wording-wise. But the original text uh, refers to the Eucharist, which is a part of every Mass. So before I get any further, let me read the words, okay? Sent forth by God's blessing, one true faith confessing. The people of God from his dwelling take leave. So again, about the finishing of church, the church service, and then walking out into the world and hopefully spreading God's words to everyone. Ah, what we were just talking about, the Eucharist. The supper is ended. Oh, now be extended the fruits of this service in all who believe. The seed of his teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. His grace did invite us. His love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer his call. So, excellent words. Number two, verse two, and there's just two verses. With praise and thanksgiving to God ever living, the tasks of our everyday life we will face. Our faith ever sharing, in love ever caring, embracing his children of each tribe and race. With your feast you feed us, with your light now lead us. Unite us as one in this life that we share. So it is really hitting on those four points the desires and goals of that sacrosanctum concilium. And then it goes on. Then may all the living with praise and thanksgiving give honor to Christ and his name that we share. So again, this hymn was kind of the child, if you will, of the sacrosanctum concilium, that big change in the Catholic Church. Now, it goes on to say, um, as I said, the original text refers to the Eucharist, which is part of every Mass, and it notes by noting God's sacrifice ended. And some have adapted this to say the supper is ended. That's what it says in our hymnal. And then others, including the United Methodist hymnal, avoid that reference to the Eucharist altogether and instead, they've changed that phrase to say, the service has ended. And um, it says most non-Catholics wouldn't find much familiar singing about the fruits of this mass. And so why they've adapted it to say, which um, it says the fruits of our worship. So it has changed to suit uh, different denominations. And then the original text However, it's almost direct quotes 
from the papal document itself, the People's Mass book that was published in 1964. So um, just changing that vernacular a little bit to make it more accessible to more people and followers and believers. Now, as we were reading that second stanza, um, it does go into a focus of unity, which was one of the goals of that concilium, a unity of people who were fed together and now live in one life that we share for the purpose of God's children of each tribe and race, embracing his children of each tribe and race. So unity, um, that unifying and evangelical purpose of the reform. And then the metaphor about um, the seed of his teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. And now that's reflective of the parable of the sower that we find in Matthew chapter 13. Actually, I'll read a little bit for you. And that says, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got onto a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came along and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. But since there was no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds ones we have in our song, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. So the seed of his teaching, receptive souls reaching shall blossom in action for God and for all. So, sent forth by God's blessing, it faithfully follows the directions of that council, the concilium, to direct attention and proper dispositions to the liturgy. But in this way, where the writing is beautiful and easy to understand. Now, uh, Omer Westendorf, he picked a really good tune for his words. And it's a tune that has a lot of movement, which matches perfectly, perfectly with what the words are about. The movement within the church, the desire to move forward and bring new people in. And we've... It's a song full of movement. The tune is called Ash Grove. And it's very upbeat and flowing. It's a Welsh harp tune. And by 1964, Ashgrove was already a very familiar tune to many people. Um, it was paired with a, a very popular text in the early 1920s by a lady by the name of Catherine K. Davis. Now, you might not find her name, she wrote under a pseudonym as well, and she wrote under the name of John Cowley, and she wrote words to this hymn tune, and you probably recognize this as well. I'm going to play it for you, but it's called Let All Things Now Living. So let's listen to her lyrics, because they're equally beautiful.
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Her words are very lovely. They're often sung at Thanksgiving time. Now a little bit about the tune. I mentioned she used the tune in the 1920s and technically that setting is from 1939. And now we know Omer published our piece sent forth by God's blessings in 1964. But Ashgrove was around long before that. I mentioned it's a Welsh tune and I guess it was first published um, as that tune in 1802 in the Bardic Museum. And it was in a book written by the harpist Edward Jones. And then about four years after that, a version with words appeared. And those words uh, were found under the title of Lin On. And there's three things about it. One thing I found says, it tells of a sailor's love for Gwyn of Lynn. And at the end of the song, Gwyn dies. And in one version of the piece, the writer talks about his mourning and that she is lying neath the shades of the lonely ash grove, hence the name. Um, and so I also found where it says the Welsh folk melody, the Ash Grove, was traditionally sung to a tragic ballad recounting a hunting accident entitled Lynn Own. So I don't know, maybe poor Gwen was shot. Um, but it talks about a sailor's love for Gwen. So I'm not sure how you can put those two ideas together. Uh, and then I also found where it said another ballad sung to this tune in England was a happier tale of a country lover. So who knows? Uh, it's um, joyful. That's why we so enjoy seeing it. Singing it, it's so um, joyful and light and fun. So um, I don't know, a tragic ballad? Hmm. It doesn't sound tragic to me. It sounds light and uplifting, why it's so perfect uh, as that sending him at the end of worship. So then I found where um, some people think that the tune itself is actually older than the 1800s because a similar air, a similar song, appears in The Beggar's Opera, which is by John Gay, and that was in 1728 in the song Cease Your Funning. And so this was arranged by Beethoven in his 12 Scottish songs. And so who knows? One thing I will say in, um, we have a fellow, his name Leland Bernhard Saturin, Saturin. And you can find, if you're in your hymnal and you look at the bottom of page 643, you'll see the text is Omer. Uh, Westendorf, but under that you see tune and you will find Welsh setting and then you find this name, Leland Bernhard Saturin. Now he lived from 1913 to 2007. He is responsible for harmonizing the tune. And so we have beautiful harmonies because of him and in 1972 is when it was included in the Lutheran Supplement for Contemporary Worship. So, and it's used for um, hymns for baptism and for Holy Communion is in the Lutheran Church where we would use this hymn. And Saturin served on the music faculty of Augsburg College and he composed more than 300 choral works. So good Lutheran fellow and he lived to 2007. So that's just a little bit about our hymn today sent forth by God's blessings. Very interesting to um, think about how when we're singing it, it does touch on all the elements of worship that we go through and then ultimately has that goal that it got from the Sacrosanctum Concilium to um, become more unifying. Let's speak in a language that um, can relate to people and bring people in um, to the church body so that the ultimate goal is to let everybody know about Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So the Roman Catholics, that's what they wanted to do. 
And here we have our just slightly altered version of it in our Lutheran hymnal. And as I mentioned, it's in the Methodist hymnal as well. And it's um, a beautiful song with a really good and important message. So I hope you've enjoyed today learning about one of our, our fun, um, lighthearted songs that we sing at the end of worship after the Lord's Supper. So thanks for listening. God bless, and we'll chat again soon about another song. Bye-bye.